Hi, everybody. I'm Joseph. Welcome back to another episode of At Home with Joseph and our masterclass in home economics. Spring is here. And what better time than to start refreshing up some of your rooms and doing some spring cleaning. This year, we, I wanted to tackle an interior project that I've been wanting to do. So the room that I'm in uh, is the original leisure room in our home. It was actually labeled that on the set of blueprints. And this was a room that the family actually um, did most of their leisure activities in. When they built the house, it was used a little differently. They ate in here. Um, this was sort of a playroom for the kids. And for us, we transformed it into our everyday family room. So we watch TV in here. It's a very functional room. And it's important to me that my rooms, even though they have to be functional for everyday living, still really look good. And there's no pretension to this room. Um, you know, we've got TVs hung on the wall. We're not trying to mask anything with decorative elements. Um, this is really the room that we come in, put our feet up, um, and allow ourselves to relax. When we moved in, this whole room was all paneling and it was all this color. So it was really quite beautiful to walk into it, but it did sort of feel dark and dank compared to the rest of the house and a little bit more outdated um, in relation to what we did with the rest of the house. So the first year we moved here, in order to update this room, I actually painted all of the paneling this white, this really soft white color, but I left the trim and the crown molding the same as the bookcases, just to give a little bit of an unusual interest. Sometimes I think people use too much paint um, and don't think about different ways to show the woodwork or um, have a little bit of an interesting element left in a room, and I liked that that was original to the house. So it was some way for me to be able to keep some originality um, in this room. And then this year I tackled doing the floor. So don't think that when you're doing a room refresh that you have to go and just do everything all at once. You can do this in stages and live with a room for a little bit and you can get a lot of enjoyment out of a little bit of work. When we moved into the house we removed the carpeting in here and uncovered the original linoleum floor. And while it's really beautiful, and I would normally keep this in most circumstances, um, we've been unable to remove the glue from the carpeting um, in its entirety. So it, it does look a little bit worn, and I do want to give it a refresh. And a great way to give a room a refresh is by painting its floors. Most people don't think of that, but you can paint almost any type of material, whether it's wood or tile or linoleum. It's actually a very easy process. It just takes a little bit of time and the right materials. That's the most important thing, is to use the right materials when preparing your floor and also when painting your floor. And so for our project, I've decided to use uh, Sherwin-Williams oil-based paint. It's a multi-surface paint that can be used on wood or concrete, um, linoleum. And I'm also using an all-surface primer to use underneath it. And this type of primer is specially formulated so that you do not have to do a lot of prep work to the floor. So I won't have to sand this floor down. It has a little bit of a wax finish on it. Um, but the primer that will go over it is a bonding primer, so it will actually help to adhere to the floor and minimize the amount of prep work that I will have to do. And today I'm going to be priming the floor, and then we will come back tomorrow 
and start with the first coat of our oil-based paint. So you might be asking, why do I use oil-based paint? That's a really good question. I prefer oil-based paint for surfaces that um, really get a lot of abuse. So trim, uh, floors, stairs, railings, um, those are all great surfaces to use oil paint on. Not only is oil paint super durable, but it also gives an incredible depth and sheen and a, and a really beautiful look to whatever it is that you're painting. Unlike latex, latex is great, but it really lacks a depth uh, that I think that you can achieve by using an oil-based paint. So I prefer to use oil in almost every room of my house when I'm painting doors and stairs or trim, and especially in this case for the floor. We're gonna be doing a very high gloss white floor in here, so I don't want it to get a lot of scuffs and scratches in it, and the durability of the oil-based paint is going to be superior to any other paint that you would use. The primer that I like to use in these types of situations where I don't wanna do a lot of prep work to something is to use Sherwin-Williams Extreme Bond Primer. It's an interior exterior primer and it has exceptional adhesion for hard to stick surfaces. So this has an extra bonding agent that's gonna uh, stick to the floor because it does have some wax on it. So this is, once this dries, uh, it's gonna be almost impossible to actually scratch through it. And then we're gonna layer on top of that, we're gonna do two to three coats of the all surface enamel high gloss. This is the oil paint that I was telling you about. This is gonna give a really nice, deep uh, texture and shine to the floor that you won't get from an ordinary floor and porch type of a paint that's a latex base. So it's a little bit harder to work with. Um, it does have more fumes, but the end result is a far more superior uh, finish than a regular latex paint. And of course, I've got two different kinds of brushes. I usually just stick with a cheap angle brush for priming, for cutting in the corners. Um, but I really do spend some money on a finer, softer bristle brush uh, when I'm cutting in the corners for the oil paint. So the more expensive brush will be for the oil paint. And the softer the brush you get, the less streaking that you're gonna see when you're painting it on. As well, because I'm gonna roll most of the floor, I just got uh, cheap uh, foam rollers in a 3 8 inch nap for the primer. That's gonna give me a really flat, smooth surface. But I, again, did spend a little bit of extra money to get a sheepskin roller, which has a half inch nap. This is, again, gonna be better for the oil paint. It's a higher quality roller. It's gonna give me a really smooth finish, but because the sheepskin is much softer, again, you're not gonna see roll marks or lines when you're applying the paint uh, to the floor. It's also really important when you're thinking about decorating a room to make sure that it remains versatile 
and functional, but also that it can be really rearranged and um, reinterpreted throughout the seasons. So for us, this room uh, normally in the winter time has two chairs sitting here uh, because our tree goes in the big window in the back. So for spring and summer, I wanted something a little bit more refreshing and light feeling. So we took away uh, the chairs and instead I placed this really beautiful hand carved bench here. Although the blue didn't really work with the rest of the room. So I'm gonna show you how I actually um, get around that without having to reupholster it by hanging some antique white uh, linen tablecloths on it that I collect. And then I'm also gonna stack some books on it. Another thing about uh, decorating a room is make sure that the things that you have in it are things that really inspire you. One of the things that I always collect and admire and love and get inspiration from is uh, garden ornaments. So stone and concrete that have been in someone's garden for many, many years and they've got lots of moss and lichen on them. The patina to them and I think the coloration of them just really to me has a lot of depth um, and story to them. So I think it adds a lot to a room. And you can see here that I have bulked up some of the things that I have collected um, old lantern posts, bases to bird baths, and also small little statues. So I love ducks. I have several garden duck statues. Um, I also love swans. So I incorporate some of them in some really unusual, sort of quirky ways in the room. I also really like to use old books when I'm styling a room. So I know a lot of people like to use interior design books I don't like, I have them around the rest of my house, but in this room, I didn't really want a lot of color. Um, I really wanted the room to feel very serene and sort of devoid of color and labels and all of that. So I opted to use some antique books, black and brown and also blue, um, just to give a little bit of color variation. So I've stacked old books just to make little vignettes on some tables. And also I've created some little moments uh, in some urns. And also I love to collect cloches with bases and stack some things in them. And I have a very dear friend who makes some of the most amazing cloches. So I've collected some of her designs. One of them is here. So it's a beautiful silver base, uh, which is just an old silver candy dish stacked with a wood base and a cloche. And she filled it with all of these unusual things in it. And so I love these elements just sort of scattered around the room to give a story and make conversation pieces when you're having people over. The other piece that she made is this beautiful cloche here because I collect a lot of antique French stuff. These are antique French binoculars and old French Bibles. She's really an artist and does a lot of beautiful artwork. I know a lot of people like to really build up a coffee table. I really do like that look as well, but for in here, I had this beautiful gold scroll table and this wonderful urn that I filled with a plant, and I really did not want to see more than that because I wanted the rug to really come out from underneath the table. Anything else stacked on top of it would have just complicated the look of it. And of course, because I love old books, I have this huge journal. It's a several state ledger for um, an agricultural insurance company. And so I'm going to rest it in here. And again, when I'm decorating with books and stuff, sometimes I stack them, but sometimes I really like to open them up to see the insides of them. It kind of tells a story. So I'm going to open this one up about midway, rest it into uh, this bench. And so it totally hides the blue so that you don't see it anymore. And what you really see is this beautiful handwritten ledger to me that really creates a story. And I'm actually going to keep stacking on top of this. So I think several books opening up inside of this would be really sweet looking. This is an old dictionary. And this is just an antique pocket dictionary. So look how beautiful the three of those look stacked in there. And because I collect crystals and uh, gems, 
I think one piece in there would really just finish the look of what that is. And of course, um, I've gotten some old blue books that I wanted to add in here. And I do like to stack things when I am decorating. So, of course, I always think fresh flowers are important in a room. And so I'm going to stack these here. We're going to relocate this down here. And I'm going to bring in a fresh floral arrangement for the room that I made. These are all fresh flowers from my garden. And just set it there and look how beautiful that really makes the room look. Adds a little bit of color, but it's something that can change and I can adjust the colors based on how I feel for the day or if I'm hosting a party. So think about how you would like to have a room in your home refreshed this spring. Scroll through some interior design books. Flag some pages to see if there's anything that captures your eye and try to recreate it. That's why people put these books out is to give you some inspiration uh, to be able to do these things. And it doesn't take a lot of effort sometimes. A can of paint uh, can sometimes really transform a room uh, and make the world of difference. I'm really happy with the way our room came out. I can't wait to entertain and have people in here. Please go over to my website and feel free to look at some of the images of our home there uh, that are up there, maybe to give you a little bit of inspiration about what to do with your home. I'm actually creating a store on my website called Create the Look. And I'm actually putting together collections that people can buy in order to create some of these beautiful really unique, uh, antique and one-of-a-kind vignettes in their own home. Thank you for joining me. I hope that you have been inspired to tackle a project in your home and refresh a room and have a wonderful spring. And stay tuned for our live Q&A. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you again for joining me another week with At Home with Joseph. And today we have Tara Shaw, and I'm so excited because Tara is the author of Soul of the Home. And this book, if I can hold this up, uh, I've read this book cover to cover, and it's such an inspiring book. <clears throat> and I connected so much with everything that Tara spoke about in the book. And a lot of the premise of the book is about designing your home with antiques. Um, but uh, for me, the book spoke a little bit more largely to how to create an authentic interior um, that's unique to you and, and how to uh, accessorize your home with one of a kind pieces. So Tara, thank you for joining us. Joseph, thank you. I love being part of your universe today. Well, I'm so happy to have you. Well, you know, I loved watching the way you transformed your leisure room. I feel like everybody should have a leisure room now. I know. I think we should coin the term and make it something, right? Absolutely. <laughs> um, Tara, if I want to start out by asking, how, how did you start collecting and what was uh, your first antique piece that you ever collected? Well, I um, really needed a desk because I worked from home. I was in the apparel industry and I traveled a lot. So I wanted a beautiful desk so I could pay my bills <laughs> and do all my work, you know, in style. So I um, had been smitten really with the one of a kind bug, whether it was mid century furniture or antiquity. So I started looking at antique stores, Joseph, and looking for the perfect desk as I traveled. And I didn't really find it, but I turned the corner one day and I saw this incredible armoire. And I thought to myself, oh my gosh, I'm here for a desk, but here is <laughs> something that I've never really seen before. I was so grateful that I pulled the trigger 
I purchased that armoire. It ended up being the anchor of my living room, you know, for all the media to hide all those things. Right. And uh, today it resides in my cabana. Oh, how nice. So you still have it. I certainly do. I love that. I love that. And did you ever end up getting the desk as well? was created was made so I have a craftsman for an individual family and um if not you know after that period it it could have been manufactured meaning you'd see more than one of those items but so what i've learned just being in the antique industry is that you have to pull the trigger whatever the item is because you really won't see it again right. so it took quite a while to really find the right desk joseph and so you import antiques but you also do interior design as well correct Right. So I started 20 plus years ago with a 24 container from Europe. I shipped it into a warehouse. I uh, it was really word of mouth in my region that I was shipping in the container and I was still in the apparel industry and I rolled up the roll up door and people ran past me and uh, really everything sold in about 10 minutes oh my god and i thought oh my goodness you know i might be on to something yeah so i did leave the apparel industry i i gave my business to the people that work for me and um just embarked uh into importing you know france italy belgium sweden at that time i was selling only to the trade wholesale only to the trade. So really in a good year, I would ship about 16 40 foot high cube containers. A container would, you know, hold about 300 items mm -hmm. uh, into my warehouse. And so it was, you know, it was a treasure hunt. I love that. And uh, Tara, is there anything when you're looking for antiques that you specifically hone in or try to look for um, when deciding what to buy and what not to buy or any good suggestions for people that might be starting out uh, collecting antique furniture? Well, you know, I look for things I've never seen before. Mm -hmm. So I think though, when you're starting an antique collection, you're going, you should use my mantra you know, which is follow your heart. Mm -hmm. If you're really out searching for a chest and you find a table, Joseph, that you can't, you know, you're going to dream about at night. If you miss it, then you really need to go forward with the table. The chest will come just like the desk came yeah. to me. Yeah. Well, so one of the things that I thought was really, uh, poignant that you mentioned in your book, and I'm going to try to find the page here. Um, give me one second. So you mentioned um, when you're collecting antiques or designing a room to look for cohesion in things, and that involves looking for patterns, shapes, and themes which match other pieces or things that you already have. And I thought that was such a great piece of advice because I have a lot of people ask me, how do you find these things? What do you look for? You know, I never, I go and I get overwhelmed. Um, and I just thought that was so great to share with people to think about the shapes of things and the look of things that you have and try to complement them rather than just um, picking up just a bunch of anything, try to create a cohesive theme. Thank you so much. You know, I feel that the first chapter in the book I address antique periods. And I, I think if you understand, uh, you know, Louis 13, 14, 15, 16, and then mid-century Swedish, I feel that you will probably 
connect to a style that that really appeals to you. So let's say that is Louis 16. Mm -hmm. And so you're you're learning to identify the periods that you like. And then when you start collecting, you're going to be seeking out other things that will complement the Louis 16, like directoire and and periods that have those same clean lines. Yeah, and you know, I think it's important too that as, as we age, sometimes our styles end up changing. I know when I was young and I first started collecting, I was really into Empire Furniture. I loved the bulkiness of it. Um, I also loved the clean lines of it, but then I realized as I got older, I didn't, I liked a more refined look. And so, you know, ha Gustavian furniture for me and that neoclassical type of um, furniture that's very thin proportion, but really well scaled, um, just appeals to me so much. So when I'm out looking for stuff, um, that is the style that I look for, whether it's Swedish or not. I always look for proportions that are similar to that when adding pieces into my home. Okay, that is really a great formula. Yeah, and, and another thing that your book touches on is that our interiors, don't ever think that your interiors are done, just like as we age and we grow and we change, or just like we change our outfits from year to year, um, a house in decorating it is also a work in progress and it's never finished. And so you can keep, it will keep evolving and changing. And that's the beauty of being able to decorate and collecting and finding antiques and, and uh, changing stuff around. Right. The, you know, I repurpose things from room to room, like that armoire that started in my living room is now in my cabana. But mm -hmm. I feel that just moving things and also the introduction of new artworks or accessories or rugs, you know, changing upholstery, all of that is really key to making your home feel current. Mm -hmm. Just like our closet needs to feel current. So yeah, I agree. I agree. Do you change up your house still with new things every so often? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, uh, you know, I still find things that are the next level. In, the, in other words, I might have purchased uh, a 19th century uh, Gustavian piece. But when I find something that is 18th century or, you know, just has more depth or character, I will upgrade. Mm -hmm. Love an upgrade. Yeah. Well, I, I thoroughly have enjoyed. So the, the opening of the book um, really highlights a lot of the interiors of your home. And when I first got the book, I actually went online and started looking up other images of your home and saw how some of the rooms did evolve and the styling changed. And I loved seeing how you changed things out and made it look different. Um, and But of course, it always looks beautiful. And I love your use of scale in rooms. Thank you. Thank you. No, I, um, you know, we have gone through a period where antiquity was really not prevalent in design. Mm -hmm. And what I was trying to teach in the book is the importance of a one of a kind item and how it really anchors the room. Mm -hmm. And then you build around that with contemporary or vintage or mid-century. So, you know, I've had a lot of fun. You're going to see the cover of the book has a, an entirely different sofa. So it went from a Belgian sofa in this photograph mm -hmm. with an Italian plaque over the mantle with a Louis XV chair uh, and contemporary table that's to the left of the armoire. What has changed, if you look at the cover of the book, it has a French sofa with minimal lines. Yes. It has a Charlotte Perrinon, mm -hmm. um, mid-century chaise, and you know a different type of contemporary uh, table beside the chaise with a 17th century Spanish mirror. Mm -hmm. So yes, <laughs> I yes. love an upgrade. And to touch on what you were just saying, I believe you quoted that in your book as um, 
starting with a hero piece. Can you right. explain what you meant by that? Surely, yes, I love that. So when we're looking at this photo, the armoire in the room is the hero piece. It's mm -hmm. 18th century, it's a transitional armoire, uh, Louis 13, Louis 14. The carbon is components, but that is what I mean. You're going to start with something that has actually pulled at your heartstrings. You have decided to pull the trigger, and now you're going to work around that. So how I did that, and you're going to see the bleach shin, which is French oak. I worked with a Gustavian 18th century painted piece. So you're really playing off of that uh, hero in the room. Another thing is I like height in every room. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm looking for tall pieces to really anchor a room as well. Mm -hmm. And I believe in the intro to the book as well, it showcased your library and on the one um, armoire that you had in there, you actually had um, a piece on top of it and you stated how you put that up there to elevate the height and the grandeur of the room to show just how high the ceilings were. That's correct. So I, you, yeah. yes, you can cheat. So <laughs> you can cheat. So that is an Italian scribble or secretary that is in my library. And what I did was I found this beautiful reliquary box that was just the perfect foil for the top of that. And it just naturally draws your eye up. You know, you could do that with a basket or, you know, a collection of contemporary uh, pottery or jars or even a garden element. But, you know, you don't really, you're not really paying attention to it when you're in the room, but it does bring the eye upward. Speaking of that, we have a question from somebody and I wanna present this to you. Um, this participant is uh, used to be from New England and she lives in Charleston, South Carolina now. And one of my very first purchases was a grand chandelier for my dining room. I was wondering what both your thoughts are for chandeliers in other rooms of the house. Um, does it look misplaced or would it work? Um, her home was built in 1853 and is wondering if she thinks if you would think that a chandelier would look odd in a bedroom or a different room so you know i place chandeliers in almost any room that will accommodate them you know i personally love a ceiling fan in my master bedroom i want air swirling around but you know, if you don't need that, I would certainly anchor, a, you know, a bedroom with the chandelier. I like the mixture, though. I like, you know, it, let's set, take my home for example. You know, I have uh, an 18th century chandelier over the formal dining table. I have Italian lanterns that are over the bar, a pair of 18th century Italian lanterns. I have an 18th century Louis XIV chandelier over the breakfast table. But, you know, then you need to add in contemporary or mid-century uh, so your house does not feel like uh, a period film. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think it's really the mixture, the interwoven mixture of, a you know, a creative plaster chandelier or iron chandelier. Uh, so it doesn't and shouldn't all be antique. You need to mix throughout, but I am a huge fan of, you know, chandeliers. Yeah. So it's interesting. I am too. We, uh, uh, almost three years ago, we purchased a mid-century Georgian home here in St. Petersburg. 
And the one thing that really uh, stood out to me in this home was um, there were no light fixtures in the ceilings, except for the dining room. And I've always owned homes that were much older than this. So they've all come with, you know, chandeliers and stuff like that. And I actually felt that um, that mid-century with no uh, lighting fixtures in the ceiling, I wanted to honor that and I didn't add any. So I, I bought a really beautiful um, antique crystal chandelier um, for the dining room. And that sort of a, a, a hero piece for me was I built the dining room around that. Um, but I did not add any other overhead lighting in my, in my home because it wasn't here originally. And I wanted to sort of honor how this home was built when it was built. Um, so it's, I, I think also the home and the structure will also speak to you about where you can put things and where it would look right. Right. You know, one of the things I see and do a lot now is use mid-century lighting in newer homes. So I would use a, an Eric Hogland chandelier from Sweden, very minimal. And, you know, the Serge Mool that you're seeing so much and then so many copies of those in white and black. Uh, a French artisan. So I think there's ways to address lighting too and keeping it with the era of your home as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, totally. So another question for you, Tara, do you have any regrets for purchases you sold, which you wish you kept? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> you know, frankly, I had to have a meeting with myself and decide that this was really a business. <laughs> and, yeah. you know, I couldn't keep everything that I knew I wouldn't see again. But yeah. so I would limit it to one piece, a container. Okay. So there. It was. I had to make that choice. And, you know, Joseph, a lot of times I would be so sick as I watch something leave. Yeah. <laughs> I'd be, oh, no, I'll never see that again. And that yeah. was absolutely correct because, you know, it went off with someone else. And I certainly did regret selling it. But I had to get over that because I needed to stay in business. Absolutely. I think I had just the opposite of you. I owned a, a home and garden store in Essex, Connecticut years ago. And I actually kept too much of the stuff. And in reflection on it, I thought, well, that really was purchased to sell at the store. But I ended up putting a lot of it in my home. So it you have to, it's a fine balance, right? Because we find the things we love, but then we also have to have a business as well. well that's, that's correct. <laughs> yes. Oh God. Um, so I do, I have a question here that somebody's asking about um, the paint. So when I applied the paint, um, I did use an oil-based paint, which I tend to use mostly around my home. Uh, because I think oil-based paint gives you a real depth that latex doesn't give you and a really beautiful sort of soft sheen that latex doesn't give you. So I do use a lot of oil, including on the walls when it's applicable, um, but I did allow the paint each coat to dry overnight so that it was really dry. And after the final coat of oil on the floor, um, I gave it three days before I even walked on it to really let it cure. So if you are considering um, painting a floor, uh, the best practice is if you can give it a lot of time to cure, you're going to have more success with it, not peeling up or scuffing or anything like that. Um, but I, you know, I, I highly recommend it. Actually, I noticed in your book, Tara, there are some painted floors in some of the interiors as well. Right, I do a lot of that too. Right, I do, you know, I do love that jewel box effect. So we will use a lot of times a portion deck, you know, a floor that 
Uh, when a room for me feels very dated, I think one of the easiest ways to make it feel current is to paint the floor. I totally agree with you, Joseph. We allow about a 72 hour drying time. You know, I'm a big fan of porch and deck because it is great for traffic mm -hmm. and you can get it in a high gloss. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ha um, have you had seen any changes in the antiquing or importing business terror since COVID hit? And how has that kind of affected you? Oh, there, you know, there's, there is a great difficulty. I've been working on getting a container out of Europe. You know, there's a huge backlog because transporters, you know, with COVID, um, in many areas, you are only supposed to travel between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. Mm -hmm. So they've given exceptions to some transporters. So that has, uh, you know, in turn caused a lot of people to not be able to export in a normal amount of time, which is, you know, turn a container, let's say pack and stuff it in about seven days. Mm -hmm. So um, huge impact on uh, exporting, but I will have to say the, you know, it, it's, it was like crickets for the first month at my mm -hmm. office when, um, we had the first news of, of COVID. I really believe people were trying to see how that was going to affect them. And obviously the concern about health, but about a month into it, our phone started ringing off the hook with design projects, whether it was Palm Beach or Maryland or London. And, you know, it, it was really just a blanket um, international explosion of design plus, plus the selling of antiquity. And we also manufacture furniture in the city yeah. of New Orleans. So it has been explosive really to the design aspect and the furniture selling aspect of the business. And when I talk to people in Europe, they yeah. say the same thing. They cannot purchase enough. It's yeah. selling so quickly. Yeah, I'm sure. And, and I think it's probably the interior design business has picked up because everybody got on a mad rush to sort of uh, feather their nest, so to speak, and they wanted right. to really make it uh, multifunctional. You know, I talk a lot about home economics where, you know, the home is really where we um, not only eat and sleep, but it we do industry, we do creative pursuits. This is really where um, we develop our soul. And um, so I think people are returning back now to understanding that home is really the center about who we are as people um, and a reflection of who we are. Right. You know, your home should read like your own personal biography. I uh, love the fact that people, you know, we work with people that collect. We also collect for them. Mm -hmm. And uh, it should reflect your travels and really who you are. The mm -hmm. nesting factor is uh, really the primary for the explosion in the design industry because you know when you when you realize you possibly could spend a next you know year in your home again you really want to be comfortable, you want to have the right office, you want to have your family, you know, just be surrounded by things that you love waking up to. Yeah, and I think you said something very important, which is um, when you travel, buy things, find antiques from traveling that um, reflect and give a remembrance of your experience there and put those things in your home. I know when my husband and I travel 
th all throughout Europe and, and even in the US going up to New England or even if we go back to his parents in uh, Georgia, I always try to buy something that I can take home uh, as a token and a remembrance, but it's also uh, creates this layering of storytelling in my home that really uh, shows people who we are and what we love to do. And I think creating that story in a home is very important. I agree with you. You know, what a great concept. You know, you're bringing tokens of your trip home with you. You'll always reflect on that. Absolutely. So I want to end um, our session here with, uh, I think, the most poignant thing that your book mentioned. And um, it's a principle that I have been doing for years. And I think it's a very hard thing to do. And it's a very practiced uh, skill, but almost an, the most essential skill, I think, which is, uh, I'm going to quote a little bit here, um, is to edit. And you say, find pieces that speak to you, then edit, 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 to give your collected pieces the spotlight. Um, editing is so important when either collecting, buying, or um, displaying antiques or um, anything in your home. And it really takes a trained eye to put something together, stand back and think, what piece can I remove and keep doing that until you get to a point where um, the pieces actually speak for themselves and tell their story. So I love that. Can you just speak a little bit to, to editing and how you achieve that? Because I think it's really important. So um, in a room, you establish your anchor. I feel that, you know, it's really not formulaic for me, but what we always try and teach is to um, establish the important pieces, work on that one vignette until it has harmony. Mm -hmm. Then you'll move to the next most important area. I feel that this makes it not so overwhelming, Joseph, because you can tell someone to edit the room and they don't know where to start. But when you're starting with a vignette and you're working in an isolated area, then you move to the next important area and you just work on that until you really feel the harmony. And I feel that once you tackle the room like that, it's very, very easy to see what needs to be removed. Yeah, and space. I think that people miss um, the concept of a void. So space that doesn't have anything in it in between, in between these vignettes and pieces of furniture that your eye can stop and then readjust and look to the next thing um, and then look at it from a totality that it creates a story. That's right. Yeah. Well, um, our time is up, Tara. I wanna thank you so much for joining us. It, it is a complete honor and it's such a pleasure for me to finally get to meet you after reading your book cover to cover. Um, I think it was very inspirational. And if any of you guys have not gotten her book, it is called Soul of the Home. Go out and get a copy and actually read it. Don't just look at the pictures because um, the information contained within is really, really wonderful and very well written. So um, if I did not get to address any questions or you guys have any future questions, feel free to message me on Instagram. Um, if there's any in particular that are directly related to Tara, I will pass those on to her. I'm sure she'd be happy to answer any of them. Um, you can find uh, the videos that will be posted on Aspire's website. Also, we will be posting them up on YouTube at Home with Joseph. And I believe Tara will be getting a copy of the video too. You can go and check out her Instagram page at Tara Shaw Design, correct? Yes. Yes. Um, so thank you so much for joining everybody. And Tara, have a great week. Thank you for coming on. I, I super appreciate it. I'm so honored. Delighted to be in your universe. Thank you so much. I know it's all a team. So yes. thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Welcome. Bye.